This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. The third Ebola case detected in Goma as aid agencies beef up a response. Sudan's military council and opposition are expected to resume talks today. And at least 15 Ethiopians die at sea trying to reach Yemen. Hello everyone, welcome to Africa Live on CGTN with me, Beatrice Marshall in Nairobi. Also coming up this hour. In business news, Vedanta Resources launches an arbitration in dispute with the Zambian government. And Casta Semenya in fight to fight the Swiss Supreme Court ruling. We begin the broadcast in the DRC where there are reports that a third person has tested positive for Ebola in Goma in North Kivu province. The chief Ebola coordinator in the North Kivu province, which has borne the brunt of the outbreak since it began in August last year, said a one-year-old daughter of the second Goma patient had been showing symptoms of the disease. Her father, the second victim of Ebola in Goma, had died at the same center earlier in the week. The United Nations officials have warned this underscores the very risk of a spike in disease transmission beyond the country's borders. Global aid agencies are now focused on mobilizing all aspects of the response to stop the spread of Ebola in Goma. Tomorrow will mark one year since the government of the Democratic Republic of the Congo declared an outbreak of Ebola in North Kivu province. And yesterday in Goma, a minor working in the province of Ituri became the city's second case of Ebola. He reportedly died. Surveillance at all points of entry and points of control in the area are being stepped up. They're also increasing community engagement, risk communications, and active case finding. This latest case in such a dense population center underscores the very real risk of a spike in disease transmission, perhaps beyond the country's border, and the very urgent need for a strengthened global response and increased donor investment. Meanwhile, witnesses report that the border between the city of Goma in the Democratic Republic of Congo and the Rwandan city of Igisenyi has been closed to stop the spread of Ebola. This comes a day after a second person died of the virus and a third person, the young daughter of the man who died on Wednesday, is also reported to have tested positive for the disease. A local journalist revealed that traders on the Rwandan side were not able to cross the border on Thursday morning. The traders were angry because their livelihoods depend on being able to do business in Goma, a commercial hub and the capital of North Kivu. The closure of the border comes one year to the day since this outbreak was confirmed in eastern DR Congo. Of the 2,500 people who have contracted the disease, more than 1,700 have died. Well, following the death of the second patient in Goma, there is increasing concern the virus could establish a foothold in the densely populated area close to the Rwandan border. The cases of Ebola in Goma were detected one year after the return of the disease in the country. The epidemic has killed more than 1,700 people since it was declared almost a year ago, becoming the second worst outbreak on record. The spread of the virus in Goma in North Kivu province necessitated its classification as a rare public health emergency of international concern days after the detection of the first case. Here we're responding to an outbreak of this uh, uh, high threat pathogen with one of the highest mortality rates of any known diseases, but in the context of a war zone. So in terms of degree of difficulty scales, we're at the top of the degree of difficulty scale in terms of responding to, to this outbreak. Goma's first Ebola case was detected in mid-July, prompting the World Health Organization to warn that the spread of the disease could accelerate. The identification of the case in Goma could potentially be a game changer in this epidemic. Goma is a city of two million people near the border with Rwanda and is a gateway to the region and the world. We're confident, we're confident in the measures we're put in place and hope that we will see no further transmission of Ebola in Goma. Nevertheless, we cannot be too careful. 
I have therefore decided to reconvene the emergency committee as soon as possible to assess the threat of this development. Since the announcement of the outbreak in the wider region of North Kivu in Eastern Congo on August the 1st, 2018, Goma has been preparing for Ebola to arrive. Within that year, local authorities set up hand washing stations, making sure motor taxi drivers do not share helmets. Goma has transport links to many parts of East Africa, heightening concern for spreading of the disease in the region. Beryl Oro, CGTN. Well, today marks exactly one year since the start of the current Ebola outbreak in the DRC. The situation in the DRC recalls the previous outbreak in 2013 that spread across five countries in West Africa. In a village in Guinea where the first person died of Ebola, memories of the trauma are still fresh. CGTN's Daniela Pearson reports. The village of Meliandu in southern Guinea is ground zero for the Ebola outbreak that spread across West Africa in 2013. Experts believe that 18-month-old Emil Uamunu was the first to die from the deadly virus. They suspect that the boy contracted Ebola after playing in a hollowed-out tree where infected bats were living. I was the first Ebola victim in Meliandu, West Africa. It all started with my son Emil. He was the first to die in Guinea from Ebola. Second, my daughter and my pregnant wife also died with her baby. Since the white man brought Ebola, in my village we never get any support. We always hear about development in other cities, building hospitals and other infrastructure. Why? Meliando is where Ebola started. It gets no hospital, no water. Ebola has caused fear in our communities. The villages in Meliandu are trying to regain normalcy, but the epidemic has changed everything. Many here feel stigmatized and remain deeply suspicious about who or what brought in the disease that devastated so many of their lives. It's been nearly three years since the outbreak was contained, but people still fear gathering in large numbers. Uh, truly since the moment when Ebola started, people have been discouraged from going to the church because there were so many deaths here. But with all that, as a priest, we are here to preach the Bible, to give courage to people. Bushmeat has not been officially linked to the 2013 Ebola epidemic, but the virus has been known to jump from animals over to humans. Many in the village remain skeptical about the link between the virus and bushmeat. They came here. They said my son died from eating bats. How can a one-year-old child eat a bat that has no teeth? They say Ebola came through bats, but it is lies. Our grandparents and parents have been eating bat, and up till now we are eating bat. All these are are stories of lies. Bushmeat like deer, squirrel, fruit bats and rats have long been a key source of protein for many in the region. Hunter Pierre Kamano says it's a question of survival. Ebola came here killing most of our people in this village. After Ebola, I still continued hunting bushmeat. If I didn't hunt animals, I cannot survive. How can my family survive? They say we can't eat bat. Let them come and provide us with food to eat. After hunting, I sell part of the animal and the rest we eat with our family. The NGOs came here promising us things. They are full of lies. Many in Meliandu are survivors of Ebola, but they remain angry at the lack of aid and are suspicious of the intentions of NGOs. Since Ebola visited our village, killing our brothers and sisters, we've suffered a lot. I was a victim of Ebola. We have no drinking water. Our health clinic has almost collapsed. A lot of NGOs came here to improve our health facilities with promises full of stories. Ebola in our village has brought benefit to the country. But we gained nothing, just deaths. They will go and tell the organizations they have done a lot for Meliandu but it is all lies. Michel Sakamano, however, from the NGO Plan International, refutes these allegations. He says that the village has benefited from various programs, including a food distribution scheme. Uh, 
There were interventions in Meliandu even before the Ebola crisis started. We set up schools, health centers, there was even a banking project, a credit and banking venture that we developed in that village. The forage, and there was even a the project of The 2013 Ebola outbreak was the deadliest in history. By the time the epidemic was declared over three years later in 2016, it had killed over 11,000 people and infected thousands more. Daniela Pearson, CGTN. Well, let's get more on this developing story. Chris Ochamringa is joining me live from Kinshasa. Chris, it's been a year since the World Health Organization declared an Ebola outbreak in DRC's North Kivu province. How has the government and the community dealt with the, for the past one year since we now understand that up to 1,700 people have lost their lives? Well, the DRC government <clears throat> has spent a lot of money and time trying to educate the people of North Kivu and Ituri province about you know, the dangers of this disease and how they can protect themselves. They've been trying to dispel all these myths and misconceptions that the people have. But you see, <clears throat> uh, the health ministry says about 40% of the people in these uh, Ebola zones have ignored their advice. And that is because this outbreak has happened in an area that has suffered years of conflict. Women have been raped, people have been killed, you know, there's always militia violence. And so North Kivu and Ituri province are different from other parts of the DRC. The ninth Ebola outbreak happened and it was contained in just three months. But this tenth one is happening in a conflict zone, that's one of the problems. And then the second one is also people have been, in those areas, are sick and tired of the government, the previous government, because they were saying that, look, the government failed to protect them from, you know, armed groups. They failed to protect them from, uh, you know, uh, neighboring countries, I mean, uh, rebels from neighboring countries. And, you know, they've also been dying of preventable diseases. That, that's because uh, of the corruption in the DRC. The healthcare system has been poorly underfunded for many years, and that has been compounded by, you know, corruption by some government officials. And so people became very hostile. When Ebola happened, they saw all these international aid workers coming with the government officials to tell them about how they can, you know, prevent, prevent themselves from getting infected. But people were already frustrated with the government, and so they thought this was just another scheme to make money. And the WHO has recorded 198 attacks on healthcare workers and facilities. You see, all this is playing into you know, this, uh, the, the, the pent up frustration that the people have. So while the government has tried, has really tried to, you know, to work along with the international community to bring this outbreak to an end, you know, there are still underlying issues about trust that the people have you know, towards the government. And so unless that is solved, there's going to be a big problem in bringing this outbreak to an end quickly. So there is an air of suspicion in the region most affected by Ebola. And as we speak now, up to 2,500 people have contracted the disease. For a person on the ground, what is the latest in Guam? And what do you think needs to happen to contain Ebola? And who needs to get involved? Chris Ochamringa, unfortunately, we have lost that transmission to Chris Ochamringa in Kinshasa. Well, let's now go to Sudan, where the country's military rulers and the opposition are set to hold transitional talks within 48 hours. This is according to an opposition leader. Negotiators from the ruling military council and the main opposition coalition have made progress on the sticking points in discussions on the transition from military rule. Beyond of talks on how to run the country after the ouster of longtime ruler Omar al-Bashir had been halted on Tuesday after the killing of six people at a rally on Monday. Meanwhile, the African Union mediator Mohamed Hassan Lebat has urged the military council and the opposition to sign the declaration. And by the way, we're informing national, African and international public opinion that the joint legal committee made up of both parties, the Freedom and Change Forces, as well as the TMC, is close to finishing its tasks regarding the preparation for the constitutional declaration. This is a follow-up to the important political statement agreed upon two weeks ago. We emphasize that if the tasks involving these two primary declarations are completed, the door to the civilian government, which the people have been demanding, will open widely, headed by a person chosen by the Freedom and Change Forces.
a sovereign council must also be formed, made up of a civilian majority. Well, let's cross over to CGTN's Coletta Wanjohi. She's in Addis Ababa for us. Coletta, what is the latest in Sudan, though, on the protests? Well, Beatrice, we understand that the activists in Sudan called for a one million march where they wanted people to protest against the killing of people in the all obeyed city earlier in the week, of which uh, about four were students. So whether this march will happen, whether it will reach one million is yet to be seen. But what we know is there's disillusionment and citizens are speaking out and saying that they need change, they need rule of law. While that is happening, the African Union, as we have seen, has spoken out strongly against it and says it wants investigations, as well as, as, well as the European Union has given out a statement on that and uh, while all this is happening then we know that the, the military transitional council has distanced itself from the killing uh, earlier in the week saying that the military people who are in, who are being accused of having been involved in killing civilians are not part of the military council so coletta the talks uh, between the country's military rulers and the opposition um, are expected to resume today what more can you tell us about that Well, Beatrice, we will be seeing the two, the, the two main factions, that is the main opposition of Sudan and the Military Transitional Council discussing on how to move forward the current agreement. What we have now is a political agreement and what they need to do is solidify the agreement by making it a constitutional agreement. That means it will have uh, rules and regulations, it will have boundaries of where the military and the civilians can reach in terms of power, distribution and all that. And also with that we're expecting to see, as we had in the, in the earlier soundbite that, that you played, we'll expect to see the, civil, uh, the sovereign council coming into effect and being designed in a way that civilians will eventually take over the running of the government because we know for three years there will be a transitional government but people need to know under a constitutional agreement how will it be run and eventually they need to uh, to pave way for a situation whereby the civilians at the end of the day will be the victors they will take over the government so collector there are some issues set out for an agreement to happen but what are some of the thorny issues in that agreement how will they be dealt with well, Beatrice, we can sum that up in an, in an issue whereby the factions need to come out uh, in, in a situation whereby they create peace without marginalization. Where, because we know it's not only the two parties that are involved. There are also small uh, militia groups. There are other small opposition groups that won't be part of this. So that is, those are some of the sticking issues. Other parties are asking, what part do we play in this? Because the sovereign, co sovereign council has a limited number, but all the other parties want to be part of this. So that is mainly what they'll be discussing. And also they will be seeing how they will move forward the discussion to ensure that the transitional government of national unity is really put or the transitional uh, government is really put in place because all this that we are seeing the protest the disillusionment is because there is a power gap so we are going to see them ironing out their differences the military giving out what they can be able to offer and the civilians also putting their if i mean their, their issues on the table and saying that they need to be the ones to lead this government when it comes into place so we're going to see more negotiation and we're going to see uh, and we're also going to see them trying to iron out their differences in terms of how power will be distributed Coletta Wanjohi joining us there from Addis Ababa. Thank you. Meanwhile, tensions are still running high in Sudan following the killing of six protesters, including at least four school children. The Transitional Military Council has now shut down all schools indefinitely across the country. CGTN's Daniela Pearson has this report. Parents can breathe a sigh of relief after schools were closed following the fatal shooting of at least four school children at a protest. One school headmaster says that after the killings in El Obeid, students have been calling for rallies within school buildings. As soon as I entered the school, I found the students chanting nationalistic songs. They wanted to study about the blood of the martyr. They did not want to study academic subjects. They wanted it about the nation. I felt the students were hurting inside. They looked shocked and sad on what happened in Kordofan. I had classmates walking with me, but when we heard the news that they killed students, we went out to a protest to stand with our classmates and to pay respect to the martyrs who died in El Obeid. On the 29th of July, campaigners said that security forces broke up a rally in El Obeid, the capital of North Kordofan State. Honestly, it's the bitter truth. Students got mixed up in politics. Their demands were not even politics. They wanted bread. They wanted transportation. They wanted the basic needs of students in schools. There have been mass protests in Sudan since December last year, with students taking part at various times. 
When there are rallies, violence and bullets, my mother always calls the teachers to make sure I'm safe. She always calls to make sure I'm fine. When I walk in the streets and I see the soldiers and the barricades, I get really nervous. I call the school to make sure the children are safe. We are anxious until the children reach us. We do not leave the house and try to head back when we are out. The head of Sudan's military council, Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, has said that the killings were unacceptable. The African Union has called on a speedy trial for those responsible. But demonstrators have once again taken to the streets, demanding justice for their fellow protesters. Daniela Pearson, CGTN. You're watching Africa Live, still ahead on the program. UN envoy calls for youth participation in Somalia's political process. And the Nigerian government seeks to harness the benefits of certified traditional drugs. How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? Or what you make happen for yourself? If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are the stories that need to be told. Africa Live. Find your voice. Africa Live. Find your voice. To Bangkok now, where Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi has met with his counterparts from Japan, South Korea and Vietnam. Talks were held on the sidelines of the ASEAN Foreign Minister's meeting. Wang Yi told Japanese Foreign Minister Taro Kono that the current progress between China and Japan should be treasured in terms of diplomatic relations. At his meeting with South Korean Foreign Minister Kang kung Hwa. Wang Yi stressed the importance of multilateral coordination and cooperation between South Korea and China. He told his Vietnamese counterpart, Pham Bin Min, that China hopes maritime issues will not affect the general development of the relations between the two countries. Our discussion was focused on how to further implement the agreement reached between President Xi Jinping and President Donald Trump when they met at the G20 summit in Osaka. And we also exchange views on how to further advance China-U.S. relations defined by coordination, cooperation, and stability. Secretary Pompeo made it very clear that neither President Trump nor the U.S. administration has the intention to contain China's development. He also reaffirmed the commitments the U.S. made to the One China policy and the provisions in the three Sino-U.S. joint communiques. China says it has held frank, efficient and constructive trade talks with the United States after Chinese Vice Premier Liu Ho, the U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer and U.S. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin met this week in Shanghai. Earlier, our reporter Hu Mengqing gave us details on the discussion. From the Washington statement, we know that the two sides discussed topics including IP rights, services, non-tariff barriers, and agriculture. But there really is no definitive deal coming out of this round of trade talks, although both sides seem to have agreed on China buying more agricultural products from the U.S. Amusing theme here because there's sort of a conflicting statement. Um, you know, Washington is saying that Beijing has confirmed its commitment to buy more U.S. farm goods, whereas what China really is saying is that its purchases will be based on its needs and on the um, favorable conditions from America. Well, the different rhetorics here really give you an idea of how difficult these trade talks are. But this time around, the two sides did both call the talks constructive, and they had agreed to meet again in September. A United Nations Special Envoy for Somalia, James Swan, has called for inclusive representation of young people in decision-making processes. Swan believes an active participation of youth in peace building is vital for Somalia's stability as a country with one of the youngest populations in the world. He was speaking with young activists from across the country at a two-day youth empowerment and engagement dialogue. 
They discussed their discussion aimed at finding ways to help youth participate actively in political processes, including the ongoing constitutional review process and the national elections slated for 2020. We think prospects for lasting peace in Somalia will be improved if young people feel represented, if they participate in political life, if they have a say in national political dialogue and ultimately show their stake and involvement in the country's future. China is set to construct a center for disease prevention and control in Addis Ababa. The project is part of a commitment China made last year to the continent during the forum on China-Africa cooperation in Beijing. CGTN's Girum Chala has more. The China-aided Africa CDC headquarters will be located at what is known as Africa Village in the south of Addis Ababa. Officials of the African Union, the Chinese mission to the AU, and Ethiopia have visited the project's land area of 90,000 square meters. We hope that the construction of the Africa Center for Disease Control and Prevention can be completed early and can make contributions to public health and disease prevention on the continent. Already, China has gifted this African Union Commission headquarters is one of the prominent supporters of peacekeeping missions and is also the main donor behind the Africa standby force. And now Beijing is geared up to build the multi-million dollars headquarters. The African Union appreciates China's support. We thank the government of China for this support, the support to Africa CDC. You are already supporting us by uh, having uh, Chinese experts from China CDC. And you are going to support the African Union Commission by building the headquarters here within the land that is allocated for the African Union Commission. <laughs> Ethiopia has allocated this land to the AU 10 years ago. Ethiopia's ambassador to the AU calls China's timely intervention a work of a true friend. The African Union has kept it for the last 10 years and uh, we, we, we waited up to, up, to, up to this point and I'm so pleasantly surprised to see that our Chinese friends are now getting engaged in this. So this is a very good uh, expression of China-Africa partnership in concrete terms as usual in a situation where it matters to the lives of the people in, in terms of health. This Africa CDC HQ construction is in fact a flagship project which President Xi Jinping himself believes can benefit the people of Africa directly. This project was announced by President Xi Jinping at the Fokak Beijing Summit as a flagship project for China-Africa cooperation. We believe the construction of this project will contribute to the improvement of public health systems in Africa. The construction of the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention headquarters is expected to begin before the end of the year. And once completed, it will house emergency response, training and information centers, laboratories, a library and apartments. Grumtala CGTN, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Traditional medicine practitioners in Nigeria are the focus of new research designed to harness benefits for potential future drug development where they can be proven. Experts hope the quality of healthcare and drug administration in Nigeria can be improved if more is known about traditional medicine. CGTN Samson Omale reports. Anini Dani is a traditional healer in Jones. For 60 years, Anini has used herbs, leaves and other natural products to treat diseases and illness. I have medicine for many types of ailments, such as a cradle cup, dysentery, pile, ulcer and cancer. When any patient comes with these diseases, they call me and I give them the herbs. Elizabeth Monday has been a client of Anini for many years. Today, her baby has symptoms of dysentery and has come for some natural medication. Yeah. 
Sincerely, I have seen that these herbs work, and I'm grateful to Mama. 80% of people in rural areas do not have access to medicine, and many of those depend on people like Anini. But many medical experts worry about the dosage, toxicity, and environmental conditions where herbal drugs are prepared. Alternative medicine is there with the herbal, uh, with the herbal medicines that have shown efficacy. So if we have patients who are saying, okay, look, I am also trying out this option. Uh, do we know what those herbs are? Do we know to what extent they are safe? Do we know for how long they should be used? The Department of Pharmacognosy and Traditional Medicine at the University of Jones is leading the research in this area. It hopes to integrate traditional medicine that can be proven to work into orthodox health care and to improve the services provided by traditional doctors. So the department actually tries to help them, you know, in terms of the issue of standardization so that uh, their, their, their products you know, can be formulated in such a way that uh, when a patient is given, we will know that he's taking a certain amount you know, uh, of the product at a unit time. It is estimated complementary or herbal medicine will be worth $111 billion a year globally by 2023. Harnessing the potential of traditional medicine that can scientifically be proven to be effective could therefore not only improve health provision but also boost the economy. Researchers like Victoria believe the government should look into the potential of traditional medicine. Looking at how other traditional medicine systems have endured and have preserved lives and are also also have economic value. I can tell you that if we close our eyes to what we have here and if we remove it altogether, we will only continue to remain in ignorance of what gold mine we would have harnessed for the health of our populace, for the protection of our environment, and even for the possible economic benefits. The federal government says it wants to encourage drug development with regulations that promote local medicines when quality, safety and efficacy can be ensured. So despite skepticism in the scientific community about many so-called natural treatments, those that can be shown to work could see traditional healers like Anini play an even greater role in Nigeria's healthcare system. Samson or Male. CGTN, Just Nigeria. And coming up in your business news. Vedanta Resources launches an arbitration in dispute with the Zambian government. And President Donald Trump is not impressed with the U.S. Fed rate cut. Africa is the nexus of enterprise, and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects, just in terms of revenues from taxes alone, $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. All this on global business weekdays at this time on CGTN. Africa Live. Find your voice. Vedanta Resources has launched an arbitration proceedings relating to an attempt by the Zambian government to liquidate Vedanta's majority-owned Konkola copper mines. The Mumbai-listed firm has been locked in a dispute with the government since May. That's when Lusaka appointed a liquidator to run a KCM, which is 20% owned by ZCCM, Zambia's state mining company. The majority stake of 80% is owned by Vedanta. Zambia accuses KCM of breaching the terms of its license. The dispute in Africa's second largest copper producer has intensified concerns among international miners about resource nationalism on the continent. 
In South Africa's struggling state power utility ESCOM's latest financial results seem to summarize many of the country's financial troubles. That includes weak growth and high unemployment rate, among others. In the 2018-2019 financial year, the electricity supplier recorded an annual loss of nearly $1.5 billion, a massive increase from the previous year's $162 million. US dollars. CGTN's Angelo Coppola explains. It's going to be a long and bumpy road as South Africa's power utility ESCOM tries to claw its way back from a $1.5 billion loss from the last financial year. So uh, to put context to the size of ESCOM's loss, it's about a, a quarter of their turnover, uh, which is a massive hole to have in your, in your financials. Uh, and uh, the, the your, um, projections going forward indicate that, uh, as far as I can ascertain, the hole is getting even bigger, and that's why the bailouts are, are projected to get bigger. Government recently approved a $4 billion bailout to keep the cash strapped entity afloat. The appointment of a chief restructuring officer is the first step in splitting the parastatal into three units to help it return to profitability. The South African Institute of Chartered Accountants has uh, agreed with us to second its CEO, Mr. Freeman Nomvalo. You might remember him as the Accountant General who worked in the Treasury for many years. We will then work with him to build this office and this particular capacity, ensure that uh, the task that he has in this particular regard is firstly to interrogate Eskom's debt. Government is hoping to finalize a white paper on the restructuring in the next few weeks, but it won't be a quick fix. The restructuring process is not an event. It's going to take several years uh, to do this restructuring, and it's a long road ahead with many pitfalls in a political environment which is uncertain and there's not consensus among stakeholders. Consumers who have had to bear the brunt of the crisis since 2008 will have to dig deep into their pockets once again. There's going to be further price increases in electricity, more pain for customers of electricity. Uh, it was made clear today that uh, prices are a long way from cost reflectivity. That means they are below the right cost. Uh, they are below the right price. They cannot meet their costs from the price of electricity. ESCOM is not the only state company in crisis, but it is the most crucial and could plunge the economy and the country into recession. Developments are being closely watched by the ratings agencies who could downgrade the country's ratings if the situation doesn't improve. I'm Angelo Coppola for CGTN in Port Elizabeth, South Africa. Market expectations for the Fed's rate cut had given rise to strong presumptions that it would be followed by a rally in gold prices. But prices instead slumped dramatically following the Fed's move. Chen Tong explains. The Fed's rate setting body trimmed the target for the federal funds rate by 25 basis points to a range of 2 to 2.25 percent following its two day policy meeting. And that led to gold prices falling after a four day rally that had preceded the announcement. Prices settled July higher for the third straight month of gains. But since the Fed did not indicate that additional easing could follow, gold could retreat further in the coming days. The Fed didn't give any signals of further rate cuts at this time, but instead eased the market expectations of continuing interest rate reductions. Fed Chair Powell said he does not think the Fed will enter an interest rate cut cycle. Global gold prices had been rising for several months before this. The price jumped from something above $1,200 an ounce in April to more than $1,400 an ounce now. The market had been signaling presumptions of further gold price increases. But now, some analysts say gold will probably continue to decline for several months. It looks like the gold has a very strong resistance level at 1430s. And I think for the gold to further penetrate this level, two things need to happen. First is the dollar need to further weakening. And number two is the global central banks need to further uh, expand its monetary policy. But what we look at the global central bank's reactions, um, if the Federal Reserve uh, to further ease the monetary policy. It only opens the room for the rest of the central banks to ease the monetary policy. That actually will support the dollar because the rest of the currency actually will weaken against the dollar. The U.S. dollar index climbed immediately after Fed's announcement by some 30 basis points. The value of the dollar had been rising continuously since the end of June.
Chen Tong, ICS for CGTN, Shanghai. Well, let's look at that U.S. Fed's rate cut and the policy statement that went with it. Some investors thought the reduction was not enough, while some economists said the economy did not need a rate cut. The move comes in the face of an unpredictable trade outlook after the latest round of China-U.S. trade talks wrapped up in Shanghai. CGTN's Rory Ruttenberg reports from Washington. As America's central lender, the U.S. Federal Reserve plays a key role in determining the price of borrowing. When the economy is sluggish, lower rates encourage people to buy, to build, to be big. They also encourage companies to invest, to expand, to hire, because money is cheaper. Lowering rates can stimulate growth. When it's needed, the bank steps in. The U.S. president has been touting America's economic success, he says, under his leadership. And yet for months, Donald Trump, who's seeking re-election, has been publicly pressing the otherwise independent Fed to cut rates, raised seven times on his watch. On Wednesday, the Fed chairman, Jerome Powell, delivered. We decided today to lower the target for the federal funds rate by a quarter of a percentage point to a range of 2 percent to 2 and a quarter percent. Powell was appointed head of the nonpartisan Fed by Trump, who said that decision may have been a mistake. Even this rate cut was criticized as insufficient, with Trump taking to Twitter saying, as usual, Powell let us down. Trump had lobbied for the Fed to signal a lengthy and aggressive rate-cutting cycle. Powell on Wednesday defended his move, calling it simply a mid-cycle adjustment. The outlook for the U.S. economy remains favorable, and this action is designed to support that outlook. It is intended to ensure against downside risks from weak global growth and trade policy uncertainty namely the ongoing trade war with China. It's not exactly the same as watching global growth, where you see growth weakening, you see central banks and, and governments responding with fiscal policy, and you see growth strengthening, you see a business cycle. With trade tensions, which do seem to be having a significant effect on financial market conditions and on the economy, they, they evolve in a, in a different way. Powell was cautious to say he wasn't criticizing the president's policy, just responding to the consequences. Traditionally, the Federal Reserve has always acted as a sort of firefighter, but some say under the Trump administration, its role has morphed into more of a gardener, if you will, pruning the economy to keep it healthy. Some fear if there are more cuts, as many expect, there will be nowhere left to go when the economy crucially needs them. Rowie Ruttenberg, CGTN in Washington. And turning to 5G technology, it has not even been two months since China started issuing commercial 5G licenses and local governments are already planning to implement the new network over the next three years. Take a look. Local government in China are rushing on board with 5G. Guangdong province and Beijing had already unveiled their three-year plans concerning 5G development before June the 6th when the first commercial licenses for 5G were issued. Jinan, the capital city of Shandong province, was the first who came up with a two-year plan afterwards. Hunan province in Shanghai followed suit one month later. Meanwhile, Yunnan and Sichuan have offered their draft 5G development plans up for public opinion. 5G is a new drive that propels the industrial internet and the internet of things into practice. We are hoping that 5G could help digitize some of the traditional industries so that they can find new opportunities for growth. The 5G era will give birth to new business models and new industries, creating room for growth for emerging sectors. Alice say the two to three year time span for the implementation of 5G was mainly based on the actual time needed to build infrastructure and industrial chains. Local plans for 5G development all underline such sectors as the Internet of Vehicles, the Industrial Internet, and ultra-high definition technologies. Song Yaotian, CGTN. And we still have more news for you here in the program. Here's what's ahead. We look at a rare pink mini jellyfish on display at an aquarium in South Africa. Join us in global business in Sea Africa through our eyes. The greatest journeys. The greatest sights. The greatest adventures. Here in Panater, this weir 
allows the locals to walk on water. We're far more than just TV news. We're your passport to the wonders of Africa. To bring you stories of struggle, survival and hope. Uh. So let's explore. CGTN. See the difference. Africa Live. Find your voice. To South Africa now, where a rare jellyfish has been discovered off the Cape Coast after it was caught eating its way through a pool of jellyfish of a different species. The pink mini jellyfish is, according to scientists, the leader of the food chain as far as other jellyfish are concerned, and it has only been seen less than a handful of times. Now, there is one on display at a Cape Town aquarium, but it's such an elusive creature that it hasn't even been scientifically named yet. CGTN Strabas Andrews has more. Meet the pink mini, the rarest jellyfish to occur in South African coastal waters. And an animal so scarce, it's only been seen just a few times. Now though, it's on display at the Two Oceans Aquarium in the Mother City for all to see. And it's already garnered quite a lot of attention, which according to the resident jellyfish expert, is because it's quite a rarity. Only see the pink mini in South Africa's coast when jellyfish blooms are very intense. Um, so for the last two or three years, um, we've had very big, very big intense um, compass jelly blooms or nightlight jelly blooms. And then after those blooms were very, very intense, we got to see one or two or three pink minis appearing. In 2017, we only saw one. Before that, we only got to see one, I think, 10 or 12 years before that. The animal was discovered accidentally by a team of divers collecting nightlight jellyfish in the waters around Robben Island, which have been washing up in unusually large numbers around the Western Cape. Amongst it was the pink mini, who is a voracious eater that also feeds on other jellies. This is also the second accidental find of the species, but its discovery could give a lot to science. Because this animal is only found in cold water and not in warm water like the other pink minis, it seems to be restricted to our coast. Um, we, d we haven't had enough samples to compare it physically to the other pink minis yet, but now we, we at least have three genetic samples, uh, or four genetic samples, and we have three jellyfish um, we actually have in the lab. The animal is currently being fed moon and upside down jellyfish, but there's also a far greater scientific value to its discovery, as it also gives insight into the health of the surrounding marine ecosystem. Since its discovery, the pink mini has also become an important educational tool for staff here at the Two Oceans Aquarium. People are really reacting towards this. I've had people come in and specifically to look at, at this jellyfish because it's such a rare wonder. And, you know, if we can use this animal to teach people more about the ocean and our role within the environment, then that, that is exactly how we want to approach this. For now, the tentacled sea creature will be left to its own devices and in its very own tank, so that more research can be done and that scientists can finally begin to give it a name that resonates with the important role it plays in the local marine ecosystem. Professor Andrews, CGTN, Cape Town. And your sports news coming up next. Here's what's ahead. Casta Semenya to fight the Swiss Supreme Court ruling. Africa, where champions are made, records are broken, legends are born. We're there for every goal, for every knockout, for every step of the way. Match point, only on CGTN. Africa Live. Find your voice.
South African Olympic and World 800 meters champion Kasta Semenya plans to fight for her own and the rights of other female athletes after being denied a chance to defend her global title in Doha this September. The Swiss Supreme Court reversed the ruling that suspended regulations imposed by the sports governing body, the IAAF, regarding testosterone levels. The verdict effectively means Semenya would be obliged to submit to hormone-reducing medication, something she has resolutely refused to consider in order to continue to compete at distance.